Okay. We're going to start with a session that's, we're calling it the end of offline, but the idea really is to look as big picture as we can at the changes that the world is undergoing. Uh, and, and we do think that this permeation of connectedness, which uh, leads to everyone effectively going online, is the single biggest thing that's happening in the world and truly transformative. So we have four very different people up here to talk about that. I'll just quickly introduce them from your, my left, because I'm turning around. Susan Athey, who is a, currently a professor at Harvard in the economics department, but about to move to Stanford, and is also a chief economist for Microsoft. She's going to teach in the business school at Stanford. Uh, next to her, Doug Gilstrap, who is the head of strategy for Ericsson, uh, which is, as many of you know, by far the world's largest provider of the infrastructure behind mobile networks. Uh, he's been in the telecom industry since 1991, which is the same year that I started writing about technology. And next to him is somebody who I've known for many years, and I really am pleased to have Bob Hormatz, who's Under Secretary of State for all that business stuff. Uh, they changed your title in midstream, actually, and now it has environment and energy in it. So commerce, energy, and environment. He's Under Secretary of State for that, and I used to appear on uh, a show called CNN Digital Jam years ago, and Bob was amazingly sage about tech matters every time he appeared on that show. And so for a guy who came out of Goldman Sachs, where he spent all those years, he was vice chairman of Goldman Sachs after having been in the State Department, now back in it, he really gets tech, so we're terrifically happy to have him here. And finally, David Z, who's a very well-known venture capitalist with Greylock Partners. Uh, is it partners? Did I get that right? That's right? And was number four on last year's Forbes Midas list, so uh, a very successful venture capitalist who I actually got to know better as a result of writing a book about Facebook, because he was in the second venture round for Facebook, also deeply involved with LinkedIn, Dig, and many other very prominent internet companies. So that's who we've got up here. Now, Doug, could you just start by telling us where is connectedness going, and how, how dramatic is this, shall we say, non-wiring of the world that we're in the middle of? Sure. Let me start by saying Ericsson is a, a strong player and leading player in the infrastructure, services, and software. And we're in 180 countries, so we have a really good view in terms of the fixed line versus the mobile side, and particularly the technologies and the trends. To answer your question, you have to look at, say, the fixed broadband, we have about 650 million lines today in terms of subscribers. Just by 2018, the mobile broadband will have 6.5 billion subscribers. By 2018? 2018. So, so that's 10x absolutely, 10 over X. the next six years. So right. just think of the billions of new internet users through mobile broadband. That is the end of offline. That is. And they're at the speeds that today, you know, I'm driving down one particular city, I pull out my LTE, I get a faster speed than I do with my premium cable provider today. Well, you, you made an analogy also when we were talking the other day about how a T1 line that would go into the biggest financial institution how many years ago? I used to sell T1s and T3s to this financial institution. The Goldman Sachs. The Goldman Sachs. Yeah. And, you know, today, you know, I, I, this particular LTE, I'm on a bus, I was having 16 meg download. And how big, how big was a T1 line, say? Uh, one and a half. One and a half. So we're 10x what a T1 was yeah. when we're in the bus with our own cell phone today. It's, it's, yeah. And this is the beginning of the LTE rollout. So if you look at LTE today, just at the beginnings, I mean, the United States has done a great job. Um, in its rollout, but the rest of the world will roll out, and by 2018, we'll have about 50% of the population covered by LTE. So that's, that's a tremendous amount of the population in that short period of time. Wow. Do you have, I mean, what would you say the biggest social consequences of that are going to be? Uh, it's, it's access to information. Of course, from that, you have health care, uh, you have education. Those are the primary drivers, I think. And then you have the economic benefit of trade and transportation in some of these developing countries. And today we have, we have pharmaceutical companies coming to Ericsson. We have insurance companies. We have all sorts of different industries coming to Ericsson to change their business processes, their business model, to basically have mobility in their service offering. 
because it's going to be so pervasive. So you have to look at all the different applications, but I think the big issue is going to be 70% of mobile broadband will be driven by Asia, PAC, Middle East, and, and Africa. The 70% of new additions. Wow. Well, so Bob, if, if education, healthcare, and trade are going to be radically affected as Asia and the Middle East, Africa are brought online, is that going to bring the world closer together or push it further apart? I think it'll bring the world a lot closer together for a variety of reasons. This doesn't mean there are not vulnerabilities, particularly when there's uh, intermediation um, in big areas like the financial services industry where there's a lot of intermediation through big institutions. There are certain vulnerabilities that exist as a result of, of, of what's going on and, and particularly the greater degree of connectivity. But I think there are a few areas that I'll just touch on and we can perhaps elaborate a bit more. One is uh, science and technology where the number of science and technology papers, the number of patents that have been introduced over the last five to 10 years has become much more internationalized. And that is to say, for science and technology papers, you have more and more papers written by people in several countries. 25% of science and technology papers are written by people in different countries. You mean multiple authors from, who are from different countries? Multiple authors from multiple countries. Right. Uh, and second, patents. More and more patents are introduced by people, a multitude of people in a variety of countries, roughly a quarter now. It's up from about 9 or 10% 15 years ago. So it's hmm. increasing at a very rapid rate. So innovation, science, and technology is becoming more in internationalized. The second element, uh, which is, I think, particularly important is that it's bringing developing countries, people in developing countries, more and more into the game. If you look at the use of cell phone technology in Kenya for cell phone banking, um, individuals in India, uh, we have a technology system where we utilize satellites that, that we put up um, with the Indians to provide in information that's downloaded to individual cell phones that tell people what the weather is going to be, when there's a good time to plant, when do you put your fertilizer on, when should you harvest your crop, utilizing space technology connected to cell phones in rural villages in India. In, in uh, another example, in Haiti, uh, we have a lot of cell phone banking, but we also used a company called Ushahidi, which is a company founded by Kenya, and the woman who founded it lives in South Africa. During the Haitian earthquake, Haitians were told a cell phone number to click into to if someone were buried. That information went to the Fletcher School in Boston. It was assessed, and it went back to the American Army headquarters, and they went to that place all on a real-time basis. Another area that I think is particularly Using a system founded by a Kenyan who lived in South Africa, who, and it was funded by people from a lot of different countries. Yes, yeah. yes, and let me just quickly give two more that I think are of interest. One, it's changed the way foreign policy is conducted. Foreign policy almost entirely used to be intermediated by the State Departments or foreign offices around the world. Now every agency of every government has its own State Department. And they're, and they're emailing one another on a constant basis, the Treasury, international part of the Treasury, with its colleagues. Just because they can. Friends, just because they have the ability to do this. They're, they're driving home at night, and they want to provide some information what's going on in the, in the markets. They can, they can interact, uh, the various agencies of the federal government all interact with their counterparts. They used to have to go through the State Department. The State Department had the only channel, State Department cables. Now they can interact everywhere else. And, and a, uh, one more example, and then one that I, that I think is worth talking about a little while, in a little while, because it's a good model. Uh, one is that it empowers people politically. Even if they can't vote, they now have the opportunity to use uh, cell phones or any other technology, primarily cell phones, to put pressure to hold their leaders accountable. You know, leaders cannot fail to pay attention to what these people do. It's not just uh, tweeting. There are a whole series of interconnections that enable people in various countries not just to communicate with one, with one another, but to constantly send large amounts of information to their government and put pressure on them in China on environmental issues, on health issues, 
if there's a corruption, corrupt, yeah. if there's a corrupt official, people start sending letter, little little messages to the party chairman of a given province. He can't ignore them. Twenty years ago, they used to have what they call big character posters. They put a poster up outside and run away. Now they do it. Thousands and thousands of, of them do it. The last is healthcare, where I think there's a lot going on that is not well understood, and it's relatively new. Here's the question. We are constantly vulnerable to pandemics in this country. Where do they come from? By and large, these flus that, that emerge and we get flu shots for come from East Asia. There is a whole network under, the, w, under the, the WHO, but also utilizing the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC. And they have this beautifully constructed network where there's a constant flow of information. We need to get the information on these, on these flu viruses months and months and months in advance so that we can prepare the vaccines. We have to determine which virus is going to be the one that's going to come over here. To do that, you need a network. You have to be able to analyze the DNA of all these viruses and figure out which is the most robust and the one most likely so you can start preparing the flu vaccine months and months in advance. That kind of thing could not happen without the kind of technology we're, we're talking about. It's totally new and it saves thousands of lives because if you only get the information a week before the flu hits, you, don't, you can't have a vir a, 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 any kind of, uh, of, of shots or, or vaccines. Now you can prepare them in advance. In return, we provide these countries that provide us this information with the information on how to make the, how to make the vaccines and we provide them with a certain amount of vaccine so we do that because we know where the flu is going to be likely to be breaking out in these days. So Again, all these a things, data challenge, right? Data, utilization of data, smart utilization of data. So you have this whole panoply of issues where, where the, the, the whole question of, of e-mobility, the whole question of inter, interactivity among people, crowdsourcing, practitioner communities is working together in, in these very organic uh, viral ways. Hmm. A lot of, a lot of imp implications there. Susan, now you are not quite as optimistic about the world coming together, if I'm not mistaken. Tell, t t tell me how you feel about that question. Sure. So I wouldn't say I'm pessimistic. I just have a, maybe some, some nuances on all of the democratization we see. So I think we're all very familiar with the anecdotes and, and the examples where having lots and lots of people having access to social media and being able to post information can come together virally, um, that, that's had a huge impact on the world. So we can think of, of mobile devices and online as just democratizing everything. But there are a few key bottlenecks that remain, and those also concern me, especially from a sort of business and industry structure perspective. So one of the kinds of bottlenecks is that you know, mo the mobile platform industry is quite concentrated right now. And then even, even there's a couple of, of players there, so the, people still have to find information. And so a mobile platform and the way is going to have a lot of control over how you find your information and say, you know, you may not realize that in, in mobile search, 97% of searches today in the US come through Google. So that's an enormous- It's a very high percentage in Europe also, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And Google, it's, it's in the 90s on the PC as well. So it's maybe not so surprising. But it's even it, higher on mobile. Yeah. So, yeah, so in, in the US, you know, it's like 75, 25 on the PC, but in mobile, 97%. And a lot of that comes through, um, through deals and so on that, that are done to, for, to setting the default uh, search engine on the mobile devices, which people are less likely to change because they're not sort of going around and, and browsing and so on. And so what that does is it gives you know, a, a very small number of players, or in this case Google being a single player, access to an enormous amount of really valuable information. And so one of the things we talk a lot about in this conference, I'm sure, is the importance of data mining and machine learning and big data. And you can learn you know, so much more when you have all of that data. Users on the phone are going to expect that if they say a muffled word with a lot of background noise, you can understand what that word is. If you type three letters, you, and depending on where you're standing when you're typing those letters, you want your phone to understand what that is. But the only way you can have that understanding is through mining lots and lots of data. In some sense, the space is even bigger than the query space because you also have the geolocation information. So that makes an incredibly complicated machine learning problem. Well, so is, is the issue then not, whether, not so much whether the world comes together or not, but whether or not 
the companies that serve as the gatekeepers continue to play a fundamentally positive role in that function? Is that the way to think about it? That's right. Well, so, I mean, we have, there's lots of information and data out there about you. Your credit card company knows about you. You know, Amazon knows a lot about you. Lots of companies know about you. But what we've seen is that knowing what you want right now, what you're going to want to buy, not what you bought yesterday, but what you want to buy now, what you want to find now, that contextual information is much, much more powerful. That's why search ads sell for so much more than display ads and so on, because you wanted information right then. And so being, being a sort of a bottleneck for that kind of information is very powerful. And if only one company or maybe two companies have access to that data, then we don't necessarily expect that the benefits from that data will get shared with the ecosystem. Hmm. So, and if you think about, you know, say search advertising, you know, the search engine is sort of a middleman between users and advertisers, okay? So if you have maybe a million advertisers or so have come on board right now with Google, there's say another 20 million advertisers, at least 10 million advertisers out there still to come on board that really haven't had to worry about online because they're brick and mortar stores. People found them by walking by them. But now people are gonna to expect to find you on your mobile phone and you may have to pay to be listed there. And so we, we, we need to think about, you know, what's the role of that middleman who really sees, you know, all the information about what users want and also is the only way for businesses to reach them. Okay, clearly you're talking primarily about Google. You're affiliated with Microsoft, but Microsoft is affiliated with Facebook. Don't many of the same points apply equally to Facebook as well? Sure, and I should say I'm uh, definitely, you should, uh, you should take my perspective with a grain of salt there. But I, what, I, what I see, of course, Microsoft is also in the business of, of matching advertisers to users. I think what's really important is the competition between players is what forces you to provide the information in, a, in, a, in an unbiased way, and that competition is also what keeps advertising prices down and forces the search engines to share the revenue with the rest of the community. But from the standpoint of a gatekeeper, Facebook has more of a monopoly position in some respects even than Google does. Yeah, Facebook has... Because it doesn't really have competition, so to speak. Yes, face Facebook is very interesting. It's got a lot of data about certain kinds of things. Now, people aren't telling Facebook necessarily what they're about to buy, and they aren't asking Facebook questions to find, you know, to actually find things that are out there on the Internet. So it's, it's got a different kind of data, and as a result, you're going to see a different kind of advertising taking place. But Facebook does have, you know, the, uh, more and more as people have their Facebook apps on their mobile devices, they do know where the user is, which I think will be very interesting in terms of serving targeted advertising there. So I, I think, you know, uh, overall, what we, what we see is that there is definitely different kinds of information have concentration and therefore bottlenecks. So in some ways, the mobile devices have really democratized information. They allow peer-to-peer -peer sharing of information. But on the other hand, on the small form factor, you know, somebody's choosing. You know, Facebook is ranking your newsfeed. On your mobile device, it's choosing what comes first. It's demoting some of your friends whose posts aren't popular and promoting other friends, you know, based on their algorithms. And, and how you rank makes an enormous difference. You know, we do experiments re-ranking links. And, you know, you can, if, if, you're, if you're managing a screen, you're like a puppeteer. You know, I can move this up and I move clicks. I move it down, I take the clicks away. I increase the font, I change the background color, I get more clicks. I, you know, I make it less prominent, you get less clicks. And so you can really, you, you're gonna balance sort of optimizing for your user and your revenue objectives. You can decide whether you wanna have only information in say your free part or whether you wanna put ads. Facebook can decide whether they wanna put ads in their yeah. newsfeed. And so those types of decisions, you know, if you have competition, you've got a lot of constraints on you in terms right. of what you can do. But if you don't have competition, you're going to be very tempted to do the thing that's going to maximize revenue or promote your own products over what the users want. Yeah, well, we'll talk a little bit about, actually quite a bit about some of those points as regards to Facebook at our session midday Tuesday, which we close with. Now, David, you, you know, live your life in this internet ecosystem that has come up in a number of respects already. I mean, you, there's been several issues raised. I don't know, you can say anything you want, but I'd be curious to know, you know, going back to some of Bob's points about the bringing the world together, whether you agree with that, and, and maybe how you respond also to some of Susan's points about, um, you know, the, 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 the complexities that the internet ecosystem represents in possibly slowing down some of the positives that we could otherwise expect. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, stating my biases out in front, uh, having been in venture for 13 years, having been in startups 10 years before that, um, 
I've seen a lot of change over that 20, 15, 20 years. Uh, and yes, there's been things that have been challenges. Yes, there have been moments and times when there were you know, people that were too powerful or companies that were too powerful. But in general, I have to say I'm a technology optimist, that if you look at that time period, the change that it's had on our life has been incredibly positive. And one of the things that's most exciting for me today is, so I, uh, so I joined what was one of the first engine, search engines called Excite back in late 95, early 96. Um, and then when that had its ill-fated merger with that home, we saw, I think, what was one of the largest second waves in the internet around broadband. And um, you know, to Doug's point, I think we are sort of in the third inning, fourth inning maybe, of the largest next change, which is the unification of that through mobile. And, and Greylock, what, before I joined, was an investor in OpenWave early in the day. So we've seen, we've been involved with mobile for a long while. And it's only now that you see all those things tied together. Um, and so I actually think there's going to be more value uh, created in the next five years than there's been in the previous 15 of the internet. Um, because I think about, um, you're always having other, you're always having different technologies added into the stack. It's almost like a layer cake. You know, you started out with DARPA, and then you, you know, Mark Andreessen creating the original browser, and then you needed SSL, and there's all these different technologies, and they all layer on. But what's fascinating is you get, it isn't a, it isn't a linear progression. You get these breakpoints where a certain layer in the cake will cause a recombination of the pieces below, and you'll get a jump. Hmm. And so we saw that, um, you know, we saw that certainly with the browser. It wasn't that. DARPANET or the internet didn't exist, the browser catalyzed it into this totally different experience. We saw that with broadband. That well, I think Windows also is a key factor there that you left out, but go Fair ahead. Enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, I think Windows in the computing line of that history, and if I think about the internet line, uh, yes, it's, it affects it. Um, but I really think that what, in my experience from the internet line, uh, then you know what broadband was another massive catalyst. The fact that you could always be on and the experience was so fast and that Creators could create rich content that you could experience, not just light text. And I think the same thing's happening in mobile. So you go from technology to sub-ecosystems, and then when those come together, you actually get value at a totally different level. And, and there's a beauty when that happens, that the technology actually recedes into the background, and it's the end user experience that grows up. So if you listen to Jack Dorsey talk about Square and the experience of going into a coffee shop and how that should change, you can't get sort of less historically low tech than a coffee shop purchase and his vision for it and how that works with mobile and transactions and all these layers of the cake combined to make the simple thing that recedes and makes the experience so much better. That's, I think, the excitement of what's going to happen finally in the next five years here where the technologies now have all the pieces in place. We don't sit and talk about, you know, when I was in college, it was the first Macintoshes, right? And they were 64K, and like, you know, they were, the, the, thing, the, the, the phone that we have in our pocket is so much more powerful than the first computers I was using when I worked. And, and throughout the 80s, it was all about speeds and feeds and statistics. We don't even talk about, really, any of that here. We've hit this point where that doesn't need to be the core focus. Yes, we talk a little bit, is it a better screen or is it a little Yeah, we're faster. talking about healthcare and education now. We're talking yeah. about healthcare yeah. and education. And, in, 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 and that's such a major change. In the next five years, I just see that taking off. You know, you go in and buy something at a Starbucks, it's not about the technology, it's not about those pieces, but you can do it seamlessly with the app and get that. It can remember your preferences. Think about what you did getting here, checking into an airline, you know, being able to do that online, being able to get your boarding pass, being probably many of you having it on your mobile phone and going right through the line. And those of you that are lucky to go to San Francisco and have a, a clear account, being able to be pre-cleared and walk right through. I mean, that's, you just couldn't even imagine that. 15 years ago, I was arguing about my wife whether I should log into dial-up and use AOL to look up a phone number or she should just call, you know, 411 or use the Yellow Pages book. And that's really the change pace. And it's really going to just take off exponentially going forward. Yeah, yeah. OK, quick. And then both of you. Oh, go ahead. If, Doug. If you take exactly that point and say, OK, that, you know, I get my push notification that my plane is late or all these things that make our lives so much easier. I mean, think about what's happening in Africa and the Middle East and Asia Pac. They're just getting a mobile phone that has capability to get data and the internet and the access. So I hear your point about the bottlenecks, but the broad information that they need to get and they're able to get, soon they will have what we're used to. But, but they I mean, can have Jack is, Dorsey's app on there too. 
you know, even in Africa. I mean, it's just the, 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 the trends of where we're going. Yeah. Oh, Bob, okay. Yeah, quickly, Susan. Sorry. I was just going to say that I think that when, what I was mentioning earlier about the, the next businesses to come on really picks up right off your point that there was a set of businesses that found it worthwhile to join the internet when the browser came on, and that took a long time to, to ramp up. And of course, there was tons of new op entrepreneurship that came on there. But then the mobile brings in a whole other set of businesses. And in some sense, the long tail, that's sort of the democratization of this process yet again. And your little mobile device, you know, when you, when you walk into a park and you're buying a souvenir on a street and they've got one of, one, a little iPad with a little card reader on there and suddenly, you know, they've leapfrogged from, you know, no technology and just taking cash to being sort of in the cloud. Um, right. it's, it's just amazing. But then they're also going to be findable. You know, they can tweet, the, the trucks can tweet their location and the, the, even these tiny little carts can, can let their location be known. That's, that's amazing. Um, and I think that next revolution, again, I, I totally agree with you, can sort of, again, be as, as much of a, of a leap as the first wave of the internet. Hmm. Two observations. Good. One, uh, following up Doug's point, which I think is really an interesting one to think about, and that is, if you look at the end of the Cold War and the end of the Iron Curtain, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Bamboo Curtain, from an economic point of view, what was it about? It was about these countries joining the global trading system and joining the global financial system. But many of them really were not, uh, at that point, able, as a result of lack of infrastructure, a lot of other things, to join the global information system. Now they are and they're joining it at a very rapid rate. China has more netizens than, than there are people in the United States. India, huge amounts. The, I was just in Russia where I'm the co-chair of the US-Russian Innovation Dialogue. The Russians are building out information technology at a very rapid rate. Brazil's a little behind, but they're catching up. Korea's more wired than we are. So that's one thing that really is changing. When you get them, they've changed the system dramatically by their participation in global trade and global finance. Now they're gonna change it by, as a result of global connectivity in ways that we can't even dream about. And, and the other point that's interesting is, if you look at the, at the, the volumes um, that David was talking about a little while ago, the volumes are staggering. What's just as interesting from my point of view is that it won't just be the volumes, it'll be better distribution. What's, what I think is quite interesting, people talked about the digital divide. And there is a digital divide, but less and less than before. If you go to Kenya, there are people using cell phones to do everything. South Africa, I mentioned the, the kind of Ushahidi. Haiti, more and more you're seeing countries that were on the wrong side of the digital divide 20 years ago catching up. Now, you know, they won't be as wired as Korea is, and they won't have as much technology as we do, but they're, they're getting more and more of it, and they're using the functionality in ways that are appropriate to their needs. They don't need all the doodads. I, I have two fundamental questions about that, and I want to ask Doug on the first one. The first one, these are fundamental, peace. You know, we talked before about ways the world is coming together in some respects, but as a company that operates in 180 countries and deals with governments and largest companies in all those countries, do you have the gut feeling that the impact of this infrastructure that's becoming so pervasive will help us get along better on balance? Just your gut feeling. My gut feeling is yes. I think um, it, brought, it, it basically gives so many people access to information. And, and from that, there's certainly a chance for misinformation to be brought in and, and pushed down. But I think people are smart enough to look in different sources and understand where the world is today and try to understand where they are in that world. I think what we saw in the Arab Spring was, was telling. Um, we all know about what happened with the mobile infrastructure there and how that was fundamental to understand the support that was needed and, and outside of the particular countries. Um, you know, to Bob's point earlier about different countries having new ways of doing business with mobile apps and things of that nature. I know operators that are actually saying, I know you can't afford the $40 data plan or the $10 data plan, but here's your two hours to get on this particular application to just taste it, just to understand what's out there, to see what's there. 
And I think it's really smart of these operators. That's in developing countries? In developing common, countries. Common. Because, and, you know, the, the people were used to SMS and, and voice call. Mm -hmm. And now the technology is there to see, you know, Absolutely. be it Facebook or whatever the application is. Um, so it comes back to your question that people are getting great visibility of what's out there in the world. We do educational programs in different cities in Africa and South America, Connect to Learn, Millennium Villages. We bring technology. Others bring the education materials. Others bring healthcare issues. You're talking about the viruses. And you know, it's, it's that worker that says, we have a problem here. We need so-and-so medicine. So it's, all these things are very beneficial. So to answer your question, I think it's a better place. OK, good. The, I want to get to the audience in a second. David, go ahead. But, so yeah. I, I do think. I want to um, get to my other big question and then the audience. But go. I'll go quickly, which is I do think like technology doesn't have a mind, right? What technology tries to do, if it, if it has an impetus, is it tries to spread, scale, and reduce friction. And so nice. the interesting thing we're confronting isn't whether technology is good or bad. The, the, the question we're asking is, what are human beings like when they can interact at much bigger scale with low friction? Mm. And so when the question comes up, is it going to be more unity or stress, there is lots of research that says, actually, humans are most happy when they have very little diversity and when they're in a completely safe environment. There's a lot of research that says Singapore has a large amount of happiness in its population. There's a lot of, you know, the other country that comes up high in that research is Denmark. And for different reasons, but social stability and safety. Now, philosophically, that would say keep everyone separate, have homogenous things. I think, in general, we believe, not everyone, but a lot of us believe that the conflict, the interaction, the learning, the stress, that comes from that engagement at scale actually causes really great things to happen that's important for humans over the long run. And technology is just pushing us there very quickly. I guess I think that's where the question of the will it cause stress, I think it will cause stress. It's already causing stress. Um, you know, Arab Spring is an example of that. But do I believe that in the end that's going to be better? I do. I do believe that. It, it, it will emphasize result. our commonality in and some it'll, fundamental right, way. Exactly. Yeah. You can argue as much the best thing about people coming together is they understand each other. And when they're sure. separate, they don't have to understand each other. OK, let me give you my other big one to see if you can pursue that thought further. The global economic crisis continues. We still don't know what's going to happen to Europe. Things are not so great here either, let's face it. Uh, Will this, possibly in ways that is not sufficiently understood, have an impact on that, maybe in a good way? I'm just crossing my fingers. Somebody might say yes to that. I don't know. Does it have an impact on the world's ability to emerge from an economic malaise that has become so widespread? I think and it does. I think it does because we understand the interdependentness and we're scared of that, so we have to communicate. If you look at our economy, in, in previous times, we would look inward and say, how do we fix ourselves? We're as worried about Asia, China. We're as worried about Europe. And they're worried about it, too. Um, so I think you have to interact when you're interdependent. And technology helps you do that. It's also what created that. Yeah, the transparency is a big that. factor. Yeah. Yep. Does, I, does anyone here strongly disagree with that? Well, I just say, I mean, again, the, a, lot, a lot of this technology has enabled enormous growth. We've seen eBay entrepreneurs in the early waves, and now we see app developer entrepreneurs, and we see that the internet has allowed people all over the world to, to trade. It's really enabled the long tail of entrepreneurs to find their customers. But we've also seen you know, that a lot of these technological changes have had unequal impact, they've redistributed, and sometimes a lot of concentration. So again, you know, I, I talked about the example of Google taking a big share of the pie as the middleman. But um, overall, I think we're going to see some more somewhat uncomfortable redistribution. Think about cloud computing. So it's brilliant. Um, if you walk around Silicon Valley, you know, people don't have to have servers in their garages anymore. You know, everybody's using cloud computing, and that's fabulous. And it, is, it has really increased the ability for young companies to get started, especially on the web, and to scale quickly. The promise is amazing. You know, all of the academic departments in five years, ten years, won't need to have these IT guys who are very expensive for them and are distracting from their core function. Not to mention textbooks, but go on. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, this is going to make, you know, we can take 
take that big room that was taking a lot of air conditioning and you know, causing global warming and all sorts of other things, and instead you know, this is all in a big data center. If you walk to the data center and you walk around, you'll see this huge football-sized building with all of these servers and no people. And so you know, all of the people that were supporting all of those servers all over the country are going to be out of jobs. And so we'll see that's just one sort of microcosm of the kinds of redistribution that we see. So I think that you know, growth, absolutely, some kinds of entrepreneurs, huge winners. But you know, the consequences for inequality are, are not entirely I clear. Think well, I think it works the other way. A word, a, 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 maybe I'm contrarian on this point, but I think it actually works to improve the distribution of benefits. I use the Indian example. The Indian farmer now has opportunities as a result of this connectivity and better information about the weather to make far better decisions than would otherwise be the case without the information. In, in, in certain parts of Africa, Kenya is an example because it's so well wired, fishermen go out, they have cell phones. At the end of the day, they determine which port they take their fish to because they get, at the end of the day, a message on their cell phone. What is the price of fish in this port as opposed to another port? I think a lot of, to the extent there's better distribution of this technology, and that is increasing at a very rapid rate. It gives people with no access to information, zero in the past, a copious amount of information to make their decisions. So you get this supply chain benefit that I think is going to be very helpful if they get the opportunity to get this technology, and more and more they but are. But the implication of that, and I, I want to go to the audience, but is that it might be really good for some of the fishermen in Kenya but it might not be good for American IT guys, or who knows? I mean, IT guys probably better, but this issue of whether employment may get decoupled from economic growth is a very interesting one, which we're not that, gonna have time to talk but about. But that's now. not a function of this. There's a, no, there well, are many issues of, of productivity, technology, No, but I'm glad Susan brought it up too. because it's something that we at Techonomy are very it's concerned certainly an about. Issue. For all of our optimism, it's the it's jobs question issue. is mm -hmm. not clear. Right? Just to be clear, I didn't want to say that it balanced out one way or the other, or even that it might not be clear that well, you know, I'm a little the, the, negative the positive. About it myself. Right, it's but a, I just want to raise those issues. It's a huge issue, but the reasons, the reasons for that concern are, are uh, several, and this is only one, one part of it. And I think that is a deep issue that has to be really dealt with, uh, because people, it's not only that people's jobs are at stake, it's wages have, oh, yeah. uh, are, are, are in many sectors, suffering. I can't feel, live with myself if we don't get at least one or two questions. Who's got a question? Get, get a mic over here, real, real quick, and identify yourself. And I want to hear one more, too, also. Yeah. Sam Stath is from Theometrics. Uh, first, David, thank you. Um, we heard a lot about uh, farming. I heard healthcare. I did not hear construction up here. Construction, $4.6 trillion industry, second largest in the world, most dysfunctional. How does the panel see? Uh, all other recessions, depressions, I believe infrastructure and construction helped bring this out using technology to improve our construction processes and create jobs and all that other good stuff that comes with it. I believe that's the game changer, and I'd like to hear if the panels would agree with that. Well, I don't think there's any disagreement that technology and the, the things that are coming together can affect every industry. So if we left out construction, it's key. If you leave out housing, I mean, there's you know, important industries that I can't, I'm sure it sounds like you're from that industry that you would argue in the last 10 years it's been massively affected. Well, he's going to argue that on stage, actually. Yeah, so I'll call that a comment, not a question, because I think it's really a good one, and it's yep. a good thing to intersperse with these other points. Who's got another comment or question? Okay, back there. Can we get the mic to this guy and identify yourself? Hi, Ben Wood from Neuralix. Uh, this goes out to Bob. Bob, you're, you're saying it's great that um, the fishermen in Kenya can, can get a cell phone and so forth. Doesn't this break down culture in one way, in the sense that you know the, these people have had that handed down to them generation over generation? And doesn't that also break down some of the value that can be created? Because of a, all of a sudden, if everybody knows what the best price is, we don't have arbitrage anymore. Therefore, we're going to drive down the prices to its absolute lowest level. So where is the value creation in all that? The, what is the, va the, the value creation is that if you, if you believe in markets to any degree, the value creation is that the individual, um, in this case fisherman, uh, finds the market where he or she will get the highest price and therefore they will earn the highest return. So in many parts of Kenya where you might not otherwise have a fishing industry because it loses profitability, 
the person knows where to do it. You, you see where to, where to sell their product. You see this in the farm community in India, too. They will get the idea, where's, where's the market? Just like you, you want to sell your labor to people who are going to be the highest bidder. The farmer deserves the opportunity to have the information, or the fisherman has the opportunity to get the information to get the best price. That's the way you incentivize people to do things. And you will have, uh, you do, you will have arbitrage, because at some point, someone will pay X, and then someone will, if they want more fish in another village, pay X plus five to get people to deliver their fish to that not, village. Not surprisingly, The Economist has an opinion on this. Oh, I just wanted to say, you know, when the internet came out, we, we all thought that, you know, there was going to be zero cost of search, and so prices would all go to marginal cost, and there'd be no price dispersion on the internet. Actually, Eric Bernolfsson's out here as an economist from MIT, and he did some early research, you know, showing basically that just never happened. So even though people can get lots of information, Price dispersion and arbitrage opportunities are remarkably persistent beings. And there's okay. still competition. Good. I like the optimism with which we are going to have to end now because we're actually over our time already. There's so many good things to discuss. Thank you guys for being here and joining us in this really good opening discussion. I like the big picture. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Susan. Really good.